Alright, Yarn Matic, right back at it. Real Raw Relentless TV. And today, I got owner of the 1501 South Mint Street Nightclub, Clyde Thomas, in the building. How are you today? Oh, God, 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 God. So, Clyde, let's talk about um, just how did we uh, even get here? Like, where did we start? Um, you mean this business mission or 1501's mission? Uh, 1501's mission. Um... It's, it's, it's about it's, it's 10 years of uh, setting my mind and getting my mind into something that I, yeah, I'm passionate about. So, um, okay. you know, I had uh, I did a few businesses before this. So, uh, and, you know, the, the product wasn't something that I you know, stood behind. You know what I'm saying? Even though I did. More. But with this industry right here, which is the alcohol distribution business, I like to say, is um, is what uh, got me into the fifteen industry. So. Okay. Um, I wanted to start off with the man Clyde Thomas, though. Okay. okay. Like, um, where are you from? Are you from the city? No, I'm from Brooklyn. Brooklyn. You're from Brooklyn? Yeah, Brooklyn. Okay. Mays, yeah. Brooklyn born, Brooklyn raised. Um, my family is from Panama. Okay. The first Americans out of my family, my sister, and um, and yeah, Brooklyn. Brooklyn is uh responsible for for this mission I've been on for the last fifty years, over fifty years. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, when did you make the move down to Charlotte? Um, I've been here. I've been in Charlotte about eleven years now, and uh, I came from Atlanta. I was out there for twelve years. Okay. Um, once the kids graduated, I was having too much fun, so I said, let me get, get somewhere that's, you know, heading in the same direction as Atlanta, but, you know, a little bit more, more my pace. You know, okay. Atlanta's like, it's just a fun city to live in. You know? <laughs> too much to do? Yeah, too much to do, man, too much to do. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, Clyde, did you go to t uh, college? Yeah, 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 yeah. Where'd you go? I attended, I attended two of them. Um, I went to John Jay, John Jay Criminal Justice in New York City. And then uh, I transferred over to uh, North Carolina Central University. Okay. And I got my first taste of North Carolina back then. I loved it. Um, coming from New York where you got a lot of pre war I mean, uh, pre-war builders and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, um, back in the 80s when I went to college, I moved down. And, you know, it was considered new construction back then where they had central and you know, stuff like that inside of the apartments and stuff like that. And that kind of like, uh, like just, it, it was just a different feeling for me. So ever since then, I've been in, you know, North Carolina. For the most part, I have ties in. Shout out to North Carolina Central University. Okay, okay. Good school. Uh, okay. Yeah. HBCU. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But I wouldn't blame what I'm doing on it, though. You know, this is all instincts. You know what I'm saying? I can't, this mission I'm on, I uh, can't blame it on a, a learning institution. You know? Okay. If I was to do it all over, and I know my mother, my mother, rest in peace, would probably kill me for saying this. You know, I say skip college, get college you know, after you, know, you start your passion. Like, just like NBA players, they go to. You know, they go pursue their passion and then they'll go back and get their education, you know, if necessary. But I think, you know, every day is a learn. Every day, it, in other words, the world is my university, right? Okay. You know, um, Learn your friend of land. Correct, correct. But paying attention to your instincts is very important. I said, you know, everybody need an education, but, you know, what I'm applying right now and, and what I'm teaching, I didn't learn that from school. And I know school would limit my ability to do what I really want to do in life. You know, if I was to adapt, adapt that system. You know. So, there's a whole process. I'm writing a book about it, about mindset. You know, um, the, the, the biggest problem for me in life was untraining myself, unlearning everything that my mother and the people, you know, 
that's, that's responsible for teaching me things, like just unlearning that yeah. process, right? Because this mission I'm on, nobody's been there. Right. They can't tell me what to, how, how it feels to be doing it. They can't even tell me what it feels to be doing You know, and, um, when I hit my first million, it, was, it wasn't a fun thing. You know, I was exhausted, you know what I'm saying? I was exhausted to the point where I lost a lot of it, you know what I'm saying? So, and, and that was just basically using what I've learned, you know, in, in, in from everyone else, college, my mother, and that, when you save money and stuff like that, like all that stuff. Is okay. I believe so. Okay. So, um, I wanted to uh, get into the first business venture, but mm -hmm. since we're on um, college, I just mm -hmm. wanted to say, like, okay, so... When you did go back to school, what did you like pursue? Oh, when I went to school, it was a, I wanted to be a lawyer. Okay. Um, growing up in the 80s, you know, the lawyer to me was what was going to get me out of the hood, uh, change my life, and create the mindset for the life I had intended for myself. Right? I knew what I wanted, where I wanted to be from a financial standpoint when I was probably five, six years old. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't something that just, oh, this is what I want to do. But there was, mm, there was no evidence of that path for me. There was no, hey, this is how you do this. It was, it was no one there to actually follow that path. So I had to listen to people. You know? And um, so listening to people was like, hey, go to school, get a lawyer, doctor, stuff like that. I'm not good with blood and all that stuff. And so it was like, you know, but I'm good at obtaining information. You know? okay. and, um, so the law thing was good for me. And then I like how lawyers argue all the time and, and the way they dress and stuff like that. So yeah, I, smooth. I went after that, but it's a job. You know, I ain't good to work for anyone, so... So it didn't work for me. But yeah, that's what it was. It was a part of that Okay. Yeah. So, um, what was your first business venture? My first business venture? Oof. Damn, I had so many of them. Um, not many, you know. One is a lot. But, um, my very first that I took serious, you know, yeah. where it was just me by myself and not partnered up with anyone and doing anything was um, the hair industry. Okay. Right? Um, I got into the hair industry, this was like before it was even cool to mention that you had hair in your head for women, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so, <laughs> you know, okay. so I had flew out to India. It was all based off of a bet I had with a young lady. And, and, you know, I knew I was going to lose the bet. And, you know, if I'd have lost the, you know, and if I'd have won the bet, I'd have been like, hey, I'll pay for dinner, whatever. So, you know, stuff yeah. like that. Pay for dinner. She paid for dinner, whatever. <laughs> but it turned down into, like, you know, um, you know, get my hair done, is what she said to me. And I was like, all right, bet, let's do it. And so the next day we went, you know, to go get our hair done. And I had to buy some hair just yeah. to to get her hair done, and I was shocked because the hair she had in the head, I thought it was hers, right? So, yeah, yeah it was really, so, really weird to me, right? So, uh, so she had that flaws. Yeah, she had that she thing, was, boy, oh, that thing yeah. like it was growing out her head, right? Yeah. And so, um, and, and, and so, you know, I, I purchased the hair, and, and the hair was like $600, right? Yeah. It wasn't cheap. He started thinking. So I thought it was like a scam. I thought her and the young lady together, because the young lady was a hairstylist. I was like, oh, they trying to rob me, right? They're yeah, they trying to get six hundred for the hair. Mm -hmm. I was like, you sure that hair is six hundred dollars? Like, we'll make that hair. She was like, well, it's human hair. Indian, what kind of hair? She was like, Indian hair. And the questions I was asking was like legitimate questions that you know that I needed to be successful in that business. But it was just basically off the price. You know what I'm saying? That's the man you was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I said, they just come out of nowhere. But I think uh, it'll still pick up pretty good. Yeah. Um, we'll just talk a little bit louder. It'll, yeah. it'll be good. Yeah. Um, let's see. So, 
So you you found out about the hair, and I'm just like, even when it came to uh, some of my female associates, it's just like when they're talking about uh, getting hair and install and everything. I'm like, you, you paying four hundred for the install and six hundred for the hair? And that, that, I'm like. I might need to get in that industry. So, so tell me about more about that. Like, so where'd you go yeah. with that? Man, I went around the world, man. It was like a wonderful mission I jumped on, man. It was like you know, I went down that rabbit hole because once I committed to taking care of that hair dude, yeah. it was so much that went into it. Like you said, it was the install, it was the cutting of the hair had a price, the coloring of the hair had a price. Yeah. Um, it depended on what kind of weft was on the hair, the inches of the hair. Um, it was single drawn or, or double drawn, meaning that like if you was to the thinner the thinner the hair is and the inconsistency in the length is a single drawn hair. Double drawn is when they 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 comb it through twice and they make sure that all the hair is the same length and they cut it. So your hair be extremely thick all the way through instead of you know, your summer be ten inches, another part of be fourteen inches and 12 would just be extremely inconsistent. And so a hairstylist is not going to leave those inconsistency in her hair. So she's going to get the shortest part of heat and snip. And once they snip, you don't yeah. spend 18, not, you don't bought 18 inches of hair, but you end up with 14 inches. So all of those things went into, you know, the education process of the hair business. That, 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 and then you had to go and get it. Back then I had to go and get it because the type of the amount of money I was spending and investing, I didn't want to send it to somebody that I didn't, wasn't able to see them face to face. So I had to fly out to India. So it was, you know, it was traveling to London and from London, I went to India. And then the funny thing about it, on the way back, I went I, from way back from India, I went to France and then went straight to Atlanta. But, and when was, uh like, can, like when could we uh, put a timestamp? Oh, this is, we talking about right right after the tsunami, the first tsunami hit in Sri Lanka and all of those places. Because when I was out there, the tsunami had killed like you know, 2,200 fishermen on that beach that I stayed at. Um, and that was like, I want to say like 2004. Okay. 2004. Okay. So um, when, I, there, like, when, I, when I landed in India and told them what I was there for, they couldn't believe it. Number one, they couldn't believe my complexion, how I look, even though yeah. a lot of the folks down there is darker than me, you know, but they could tell that you yeah. from somewhere else, you know. Yeah. And so that was weird, you know. And then they, this is before that movie Slumdog Millionaire, so it was like a culture shock for me, right? Yeah. You know, going to this primitive country where monkeys dominate. Walk outside, the monkeys just run around there hunting. Oh, you know, yeah, you got, you got tiger issues and stuff like that. Like, you so close to it, you see cows. Like yeah, yeah, you got tiger <laughs> issues and stuff like big cat issues. And then, you know, if you ain't ever see slum dog millionaire, I mean, the corruption out there is on another level that I didn't know. Okay. But I went out there and I went. I was able to purchase here, and back then it was different. So. I think it was like a twenty thousand dollar investment that turned into like maybe a four hundred thousand dollar investment once I got to my continent. So, and then it was a process, you know. Like the first time I went out, like I said, I stopped in London and then went into India. And on the way back, I stopped in France and went back to the U.S. But when I stopped in London, the first time I went there, I met these uh, African ladies. They had like some of the. Like the, the accent was so beautiful where you have this British, African, American accent all intertwined, right? And they was about it, man. Like, you know, the big, big face roll. They was wearing men rollers watches and stuff like okay. that back then, right? And they was educating me about the hair in London. And and I told them the mission I was on, and they was like, well, bring some back. And I was like, well, I'm stopping in France on the way back. But the next time I go to India, I'm going to go through France, which I don't like, and then on the way back, stop in, stop in London. Okay. So I would, on the second run, I brought hair back with me, you know, like 100 pounds of hair. They allowed me to carry that much on the plane. And then um, 
stop in London, did a day in London for Soul Slim up there. Right? Okay. And I was able to, like, like the Matrix system, right? Like, it's like $100 US is like $50 British Euro pound, right? Yeah. Euro pound. So you fly over to India, right? I mean, you fly over to India with US dollar, purchase a product, right? Yeah. That product you bought in the US dollar. So a rupee is like maybe, maybe, I don't even know, 3000 dollars to one u.s dollar so you get so much for your money right and now I, on the way back home i stopped in london right and got that british pound yeah right? so something that cost 800 us i was able to sell for 800 pounds in london right which is 1600 yeah right so if i knew better then or my mind was so focused on being successful in the U.S., I could have just went from India to London and they, I mean, chopped off maybe five, six years of my whole mission. You know okay. What I'm so how did you initially get like the connects to meet people in India? Cause I'm like, you going all the way overseas, like yeah, it, how do that you was meet a mission. people like out yeah, there? Like that, that was like a, a, a maybe like a two week mission because I had to understand that. It's a time different. They're like a twelve hour difference. So yeah. if you call them one o'clock in the afternoon is one o'clock in the morning. They sleep. Mm -hmm. So for me to build that connection, I had to understand that wow, why ain't I answering the phone and calling? I call them three in the afternoon, I call them. So I say, you know what? It's timing, right? I'm gonna call them one o'clock in the morning, US time, right? Yeah. And see if they answer. And when I called, they answer. And I told them what I was after. They gave me their email. I got the direct contact. They shot it back to them. We communicated. They invited me over. And then I was able to, because they, what it is, they donate here, the here to the temples, right? Yeah. And only the Indian folks can go and get it from the temples. You and I can't go. So they'll go, and then when they get it, they'll sell it to us, right? So there are different families that you got. It was Lucky, Supreme, uh, Ravi and Raju. Those guys, they were amazing. And they were making money all over. They didn't even touch the U.S. market. They had board games, Indian board games. They had so much stuff going on. And uh, Supreme, he was like, I used, I like calling him the Pablo Escobar, the hair business. Because okay. he had so much of it. But we, I, I was able to make it make pretty. I mean, I did it for 12 years out there. Okay. So, uh, how many business ventures did it take for us to get into this? Um, after the Indian, after the hair business, it got saturated. I mean, Atlanta, you know, there's a lot going on in Atlanta. They got hit to where the hair was coming from, so they started stealing my packages and stuff Still like that. Play. Yeah, okay, it kind of ran me out of business that way because it got saturated. You know, not only they were stealing my product, but they were selling my product for half the price that I would even sell because they had no overhead. They didn't even start. I had three stores out there. I had employees. You so, know, did you, you make your first uh, seven off that? Seven pigs off that? I generated it before I was capturing it, you know, but the lifestyle definitely was on that level. So that's when they started changing the mindset and was like, okay, this is obtainable. Like, correct, is correct, obtainable. correct. Because it was just so fast. And not fast like in selling illegal narcotics, but fast when it comes down to business because you're making your money the second you purchase it. And then there's so many avenues to not only double, but triple, not even triple. You know, like I said, from a 20000 in a twenty thousand dollar investment i always say like this like if somebody was to give me and i'm just speaking hypothetically right yeah a thousand dollars and say what well, back then what would you do right okay. i'll say i'll uh, say a thousand dollars in a, a round trip ticket my round trip ticket would be to india right with a connection in london Right, on my way back to the U.S., right? So I will, I will request for a direct flight to India. And from India, I need to connect through London, right? You give me that $1,000, right? I fly to India. 
and I bought a kilo of here. Maybe two. Because back then a kilo was like maybe 300. So maybe I could get, for $1,000, get three kilos of here, right? Yeah. And I stopped in London on the way home, right? Yeah. And that kilo, that three, that kilo you get is two pounds of hair. A whole head is eight ounces. So you got four heads of hair out of one kilo. So you, you see four, it's 16 heads of hair, 16 clients. So on average, if we do 22 inches back then, you could get anywhere from six to seven hundred dollars. Okay. Right. Her head, right? So you got a thousand dollar investment. Say you get ten heads out of it at seven hundred dollars yeah. a pop. You done made seven thousand dollars yeah. off that thousand dollar investment. Right? And it's crazy because it's just like you bring it down like it's straight in the game. Like it's straight like, game, right? <laughs> but what you're doing is now you time traveling, right? <laughs> yeah. Time okay, traveling. Okay. We but flying you, from here yeah. to India. Yeah. Where it's three hour a twelve hour different. Okay. You find a product at an extremely low price because you done killed every middleman that you even killed yeah. the mailman. Yeah. <laughs> right? Now you, you stop on your way yeah. back home, you stop with seven thousand dollars worth of product, US. Yeah. And you stop in London where that seven thousand in London is really fourteen thousand. So let's go. Because you're gonna do this British pound thing. So yeah. now you you buy you sell all your hair in London, right? Okay. Right? So now you end up with 14000 U.S. off a $1,000 investment, $7,000 worth of hair U.S., but in London, we're dealing with the British Crown, so it doubles. So you say $14,000 you got off that, and then you land back in the U.S.A. Okay, okay. And you did all of that in about four days. So, so you took a 1000 So in four days, you can make $1,000, well, $20, almost $20,000 if, around with, around in the hair industry, correct. Back then. Okay. It's probably still like that, but that number will probably be, say, a thousand hour investment, and you do exactly what I said, it'll probably be about mm -hmm. 7,000 USD. Okay. Because of that whole. And, but then again, I don't know how much hair is going for in London. See, it's, it, 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 it really didn't even change in the US, just the price in India changed. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a real product, so you gotta wait for people to go in. Okay. You buy too much of it, then you got a bunch of money. You know, and then you ain't got no money, so. I feel it, I feel it. Yeah. So, um, when it came to uh, traveling, like, were, did you always used to travel when you were a kid, or like, did it take until you started getting to your businesses to start like getting on planes, going to different? Uh, I mean, um, my mother, she, when I rest in peace, she, um, she, she, it was our, her duty to make sure we go somewhere during the summer. So it would be Chicago, Florida, Panama, wherever it was, you know, summer, summer vacations wasn't, it didn't mean that you stayed home. It was like getting you out, you know, so, so I did a lot of, did some traveling as a kid on that level. But um as I got older now it's it's strictly to either, you know, get a bag or hang out a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I like hanging out in Vegas because of um, the fights and stuff like that. And then I make a little bit of money off it with the back end side of fights, like promoting parties and after parties and meetings and stuff like that. For fights and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. I know that uh, you said when you made your first million, you felt exhausted. Correct. What was uh, the hardest part of that journey? It's not knowing that you was making the money. You know, you know it was, it was um, you know, a vision is vision. Right? When people say you have vision, it's the ability to see something and focus, meaning that you're looking at something. So you can see and you can focus on something, right? So if you're not focused on what you're doing, right, then you're blind, right? Because then, then, even though you got vision, you can see in there, it's just cl it's cloudy. So you really don't know what you're doing, right? And so you miss the whole process. And 
You constantly keep repeating yourself, repeating, 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 repeating. And that can be draining if it's not going anywhere. Now you want to repeat a process of just moving you forward, right? So if you make a thousand dollars out of, if you make a dollar out of one space, right? All you got to do is repeat that a million times. A million dollars, right? It's that simple. But if you make a dollar out of somewhere and you repeat that process again and still end up with a dollar and you repeat that process again and end up with a dollar and a dollar and a dollar. You're not losing, but you're not making. The treadmill stuff you're right in business is the worst thing that can happen to you because you know, if that's all you making enough to stay afloat, then if something happened, then you don't have enough to fix the problem and stay afloat. Right. So that's where the exhaustion is coming because you're doing all of it and getting nowhere. But you still made that money, you know what I'm saying? You still generated maybe six, seven million dollars in a short amount of time. You got people that lived their entire life in order to generate that kind of money. Right. So it's just, it's all, you, if you understand the mission that you're on, you don't get tired. You know, like if you and I, we get out there and we just go for a three mile run. Yeah. In your mind, you prepare yourself and condition yourself for three miles. So we get out there and we run three miles. But if you and I get out there and get to running and I don't tell you how long, you're going to be thinking, damn, how far we got to you, your, your mind is in condition to go that distance because you're not prepared for it. Right? So, toasting, preparation, man, staying focused. And know what you're doing it for so you can end up with what you started out, what you was chasing. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. So, um, earlier you said um, when it comes to uh, after you do it the first time, it's like the first time is exhausting. So, once you learn that process, does it then become easier? Yes. Because you understand the process. You know where you're headed. Everything is clear. So there's no rush. You know what I'm saying? You can pace yourself, right? You can breathe, you can take deep breaths, you can relax when it's time to relax, you can sleep when it's time to sleep, you can go hard when it's time to go hard because you know exactly where you're going in your business, right? And and, and it starts off with knowing the product. Like for me, my product of choice is alcohol. Okay. Right? I want to sell alcohol, right? Because when somebody dies, you get a drink. When somebody born, you get a drink. Uh, when you get married, you get a drink. When you get divorced, you get a drink. Um, you know, um, somebody dies, you get a drink. Somebody born, you get a drink. Stuff like that. Like I'm 52, I always say it that. You know, um, I've never seen someone lose their job and go buy a house. That's why I don't sell real estate. I never seen somebody lose their job and go buy a car. Right. <laughs> That's why I don't sell cars, right? Hey, yo. If somebody lose their job, they're going to get a drink, right? Before yeah. they tell their wife or their husband, before they tell anybody they lost this job, they're going to go see that bartender. They're going to go get that drink. Get the courage they need. Like, we walked in today and you was like, hey, we they drinking. You was like, yeah, you want to drink? I'm, yeah, I'm in the liquor we, business. We Why it. not? Hey, we need one. Hey, they didn't even need one, but like, hey, it. you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. with a commodity like that or a product like that, you know, how can you lose? Yeah. Now, the only way you can lose is if you in this industry because everybody knows. Yeah. I know a lot of people say, oh, oh. So being that you know a lot of people, you don't know what you're selling. So when a lot of people come in and they want to drink, you get free drinks to a lot of people. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you're on that treadmill now. You yeah. No money. Right. But the only thing is, it's just like, I know, I'm pretty sure you're aware because you've done different business ventures over time. But it's just like, it's easier to make a, a, support, a supporter a friend than it is a friend a supporter when it comes to these different businesses. And it's just like, even though you can't, take it to heart with everybody but it's just like at the same time you still understand where they stand on mm -hmm. different things like that yeah you should you should yeah. take it to heart i always say if you want to find out who your friends are open a business yeah. and if you want to make some friends open a business because you're going to meet the right mm -hmm. friends right mm -hmm. 
I'm a hunter, right? And I don't try to because it get deep. It, I, I go even deeper, right? Yeah. I go like I said, if I'm in a, like in other words, right? 1501. We sell food. We sell hookah. We sell alcohol, and we sell that lifestyle. Right? Yeah. I'm responsible for alcohol and lifestyle. When it comes down to the food, I'm the landlord. Yeah. I got I got a square footage and I rent that out to somebody that has a food truck. I don't want to buy knives, corn, salt, pepper. I don't want to buy steaks because, like I said, I have never seen somebody say, "Hey, give me a double round of steaks." You want some more chicken wings? Give us a get up, give everybody another round of chicken wings, <laughs> right? Man. Double up okay. on the French fries. You don't you don't get that in the restaurant industry for me. Yo, let me get another round for the staff. Yeah. Make that a double shot of uh, uh, Boston Thomas. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Stuff like 1936. Let me get that. You know, so it. We, 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 so that's where I want to be. I don't want to be into selling food because now you don't like it. You spit it out. Now I'm behind twice because not only I lost that plate you threw out that you didn't like. I gotta make you another plate that I'm not paying for. I mean, that you're not paying for. So you didn't pay for the first one, right. and now you're getting the second one that you didn't pay for it as well. So now I gotta sell another one just to make that money back. Yeah, it's too much for me. When you open a bottle of Hennessy, just like you open this bottle of water, or a bottle of Boston Thomas again, it's what it is, you know. But if I open a case of chicken, and you know, I. I, I, I cleaned it with some pork juice. You know, I don't eat pork, so I'm not gonna eat it. Even though it's chicken, but it came out as chicken. So it, it, it's it's stuff like that that I, wanna, that I like to stay focused on. So you want to give people uh, just straight what they're looking for off rip? Because sometimes when it comes to like something that can be subjective, as in I'm like, okay, like who has the best fried chicken? Well, you feel me? It's a thousand different fried chicken. But when it comes to like, uh, what's better, Jack or uh, whiskey? Or a jack or a crown, it's just like, okay, it's either going to be jack or it's okay. going to be crown. It's Correct. Be like, Correct. Right. Correct. Correct. Exactly. The people that drink know exactly what they drink, right? Yeah. You ever went somewhere and say, hey, let me get a uh, Hennessy, and they gave you Patron. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even have to taste it. You know, hey, this is not uh, Hennessy. <laughs> oh, really? What is this, right? But you go to a Chinese restaurant and they'd be like, this is General Salt's chicken. You look at that and be like, oh, this don't even look like, how's this chicken? Right? You can't, but you just take their word for it and you eat it anyway, right? Yeah. So drinkers know exactly what they drink. They know what they want. It's no confusion. All you have to do is give them what they ask for. If they ask for Boston Thomas, you give them Boston Thomas. You don't give them Hennessy. You don't give them Great Goose. You don't give them anything else. And, and and that lies to success, you know what I'm saying? I mean, and, and yeah. just controlling that product, understanding what you're dealing with, and block out everything else, like from food, hookah, all of that stuff, is to me, is just an, a, dis, a distraction, because I'm OCD. If you get me in a hookah, I'm going to want the best hookah ever made. If you get me in the jerk chicken, I'm going to want that jerk chicken to be consistent across the board like the first time you taste it I want it to be like that the last time you taste it like McDonald's for example right to go back to India right um that was my choice of because I don't I, and I don't even eat McDonald's I wasn't eating it when I went there but when I got there that was my choice that was something I trust right I wasn't eating any of their food because I didn't want to get sick not that I had anything against it but you know, I, I wasn't near that long to have to deal with getting sick, recovering, yeah. then still handle business, right? So I went to McDonald's, right? And when I stopped in, in, in France, I ate McDonald's. It was the same McDonald's I had on Parkside in Brooklyn, right? When I went to London, I ate McDonald's, and it was the same as I had in uh, in Peach Street in Atlanta, Georgia, right? And, and when I went to India, it was like the same... McDonald's that I ate on Try On in Charlotte, right? Yeah. And it was uh, under ten dollars. This meal is under ten dollars, but it's consistent across the continent. And on top of across the continent, it is city to city, state to state, block to block, 
corner to corner, wherever you go, in McDonald's, oh, since I've been around, the only thing changed was the apple pie, right? Right. And it's But the fries has been consistent. You know, they, they get a little mature with the wrapping and so on and so on, based on styrofoam at one time was cool, but it ain't cool anymore, and all this <laughs> stuff, right? But the food is pretty consistent. If I get you, get me in the food, I'm gonna invest a lot of time and money into that, and then it's gonna take me too long. I'm gonna get exhausted. Then I'm gonna make a million dollars and only get food. So that that job is for somebody that's passionate about food, but you can still have it inside your business because it's very important for my business that people eat and drink. Yeah. But you can you can be the landlord in these places and don't have to chase every dollar. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, would you say the food, uh, having food trucks out there is also like putting people in position as well? Because it's just like uh, people are, are still going to want to eat and it's just like Correct. mutually beneficial. People are eating and drinking. They Correct. eat what they eat food. I mean, eat what they drink. So. Correct. And, it, and what it is, is exposing those other businesses to South Bay, Right? Okay. Um, you know, they're all over different places. Not saying that I'm responsible for them to be in South Bay, but. I am at that moment, right? You got a place to land and make some money, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's our complexion, even though we invite everyone, but those, for the most part, those are the people that, you know, that's the that's the them that, that want to feed, you know, what we're giving, right? Yeah. But like I said, I become the landlord. I provide an opportunity for other businesses to eat, and then I provide a service for the people that come and hang out with me. And then sometimes it'd be their favorite food truck in it. Yeah. Or they get exposed to a new food truck. So it, it works. Uh, who are some of the uh, food trucks that you had out there so far? Um, right now we got Perry. Perry is our resident uh, food truck. He's there every day. Um, Mariah, she has some amazing tacos. She had a great following. Um, uh, Cousins Cuisine. Um, we're working right now. We're doing stuff to do brunch with Made From Scratch. Kid is amazing, man. He's, like, he's from my hometown. Um, and he specializes in brunch, you know. And it's, and it's what you want, you know what I'm saying? It's not, you know, so far-fetched. You get your lobster mac and cheese. You get your, your French toast. You get your grits. You get your, you get your salmon. You get all of that good stuff, you know what I'm saying, without... Somebody getting too creative around brunch, you know what I'm saying? But um, yeah, it works. It works. So, um, there's this quote in your bio, and it says you are responsible for how people remember you or don't. So don't take it lightly. Correct. How has that played into the the man that we see today? Yeah, that's that Kobe Bryant. Oh, um, yeah. You just, I mean, you never know who's watching, right? And um, with that said, you know, your mother could be watching, right? So you, you, and, and then your wife you never even met could be watching, right? Um, an opportunity, a great opportunity could be watching, you know? So, so, upon your introduction, you want to, you want to be on your best behavior, right? Yeah. And, and it creates that ownership because meeting you, you was on your best behavior. So you act like that throughout your life. You don't want to get away from that. You know what I'm saying? I say, pe I say people don't change, only their circumstances, right? So if, if you're a great person, you're not going to change into a bad one. But given the circumstances, you might, right? But if you're a great person, your circumstances ain't gonna change either because you're not gonna put yourself in a position unless something happens. So for me, it's just, you know, I just wanna, I just wanna make anyone that come around me get something out of it. You know what I'm saying? I don't wanna waste anybody's time or anything like that because I don't like anybody wasting anything. So, okay. okay, that's real. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, let's let's talk. Uh, let's divulge back on fifteen oh one. Who is Leslie Briggs to you? Whoa, well, Leslie, man. Um, 
I met Leslie because well, uh, when I first got to Charlotte, um, we had opened this spot called Sports One, right? Um, Peter Thomas and I and Carlo, we had uh, we had we had opened that spot right here in Charlotte, right? And Peter was on the Housewives of the Atlanta show. He had a lot of momentum. So I was like, you know, I'm in Charlotte, you should come down here and do whatever, you know, open up something, let's get a bar. And we came down and we opened the bar. And um, it was a young lady that was working for us. Um, she was like, um, I have a friend of mine that I want to bring in. She's looking for a service, you know, a service job. And I was like, I right, bring her in, I interview her, whatever. And it was Leslie. And so we sat down, we sat for like two seconds, and she was like, hey, come here for a second, I want to show you something. I was like, all right, so she, we were sitting in the back of Sports One, and we got up, we walked all the way to the front, we went to the host stand, the host stand, where there was a stand, and behind us on the wall, there was a big picture of Peter, right? Um, Peter Thomas was a big, giant picture, and, and she pointed to that picture, she was like, Peter looked great and everything, but if you put a television right here, a monitor, with, with um, uh, advertising, you know, your food, your, your events for the week. And you could even put the picture of Peter on that, but it can also use as a marketing tool, or advertising, advertising tool. I was like, wow, that's a good fucking idea. Excuse my language, right? Yeah. But it caught me, like, I, I didn't even hire this lady yet. And she's showing, she's displaying management. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, like she's an asset. Correct. So she already brought in the next day, bought a TV, a little 40 inch TV, put it back there, we loaded, put the jump drive in the back, loaded it up, and voila. And after that, I went on to design and partner up with Stats over here on the university side. And if you walk in the Stats, you see a television as well behind the whole stand. So every, I, I did Cashew, I did a few, designed a few spots in here outside of 1501. And I would always stick that in the back of the whole stand. That's something I got from Leslie. Okay, so, okay. Yeah, so when I, when, I, when I bought 1501, I called her in. She was working at Stats. And I was like, you know, well, because I, I hired her over at Stats, right? I, I hired at Sports One, then I hired her over at Stats to manage and run the business as well over there. But it didn't work out too well. But, you know, she she went. She turned out to because I had partners, right? And um, and they would they were they were majority of us. My investment in that situation wasn't a lot, so it was basically their business. So whatever decision they wanted to make, it was on them, and they didn't want us to be a manager, right? So when I got out of that situation, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna blow out, but you know, I do on me leaving, you know, I would like Leslie to step in. Yeah. And stats because I wanted to go. You know, I know y'all relationship with her isn't the best, but I know she's the best for the business. Right? So you know I got cashed out, whatever the snatter went about my way. Pass torch. Yeah, and she did her thing over there. So when I got back to the drawing board to get on this mission that I was on by myself, because like I said, I'm in it to sell liquor. And if you got other people as partners, it's kinda of hard for you to focus in on that because they want to focus in on other things for the business that's going to take the business in a different direction, right? So I bought 15, and when I bought 15, I came back for Lance, and I was like, hey, um, I match whatever stats is paying, but I would also give you partnership. Right? So if I'm willing to match and give you ownership, they want you want to stay there, just have to tell them match it. Time to step you up in the city. You've been, you've been doing this as long as I've been doing it. And so they wasn't willing to match, so she came over as a managing partner. And we've been rocking ever since. Okay. Cool. I go to war with women, man. I love it. Oh, yeah. 1501? 1501 is known as predominantly being ran by black women. So, what are some of the pro uh, pros of working with so many uh, black women? Um, women to me, man, is like um, they're good hunters, man. You know, you know, they, 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 they 
pretty focused. I was raised by women, so, so I have a, I have a pretty good understanding, and I'm comfortable with working with them. It's like um, like an animal kingdom, right? You got you got uh, the lion. Yeah. His pride consists of women. Right? He chooses to hunt with women. Um, so who really runs that pack? You know, right? um, you, you, you get into wolves, right? But the, the leader of the, the pack is a female. Right? She's, a, she's even bigger. You know, um, they just focus, man. You know, very focused when it comes down to business. Um, yeah, some of them, you know, Women, some women, you know, like any other person, would, would stay off the path. You know, but for the most part, when it's time to make some money, you know, they're, they're blocked out and you get to the back. So I, I choose to do it any time. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just like, uh, shout out to D. She gave me the best drink. Uh, when I came out to 15 yeah, the other night. Um, who are some other notable names that have came through to 15 Oh. I mean, I'm, I'm not good with names. But, um, I mean, what I can say, we had a lot of uh, football players, basketball players. Politicians, actors, um, boss performing, we had no team, my, uh, um, we even had Black China. <laughs> I mean, stuff like that, different uh, writers and, and executives that we had. And then we had like a, a few organizations that came through. And sororities and fraternities. I mean, you know, it's your everyday spot, man. Yeah. yeah. And it's growing, it's still growing. Huh? Yeah. So, it's pretty cool. so um, let's talk about. Um, I, I hear you have a new book coming up, Emotional Man. No, 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 no. It's not the Emotional Man. I haven't named it yet, but I do talk about it. A new breeder man. A new breeder man. Okay. Correct, correct. So, correct. so what is uh, the emotional man? Okay, the emotional man, right? The emotional man, and, and I'm part of it, right? Um, when it's men where that were raised by women. Okay. Right. Um, and then they have the father around them, so. You, you you know you look sound everything like a man but inside you have some form of a woman inside of you because you were raised by one, the characteristics of one right? okay. and as you grow you have to break that and develop you know attach yourself to male figures to read up on certain things to curb that personality you know what I'm saying so it is is with that you have dudes that would sit and argue with women, you know, they would let women take care of them, you know, they would, you know, um, use them in cars and stuff like that, you know, moving with women. They 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 put them in jody. Yeah, I'm from baby boy. Correct, correct, okay, correct. Okay, okay, That's yeah, the emotional man, even in baby boy. You okay. remember that? Till she met the dude that was walking around the house and, and was like trying to create some form of structure. This dude didn't know how to deal with it. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. and it was designed that way, you know, and to, to create this new man, right? And that's why you have, you know, have the feeling. 
We have the deep argument. We have the deep regrets. We have that beef that lasts forever. That's the killing of the killing is because, you know, a woman's gone. Men didn't help. We didn't, we didn't, we dealt with it growing up. We dealt with it and it was over with. You know, we fought like men and we shake hands like men we don't carry for a man and that respect is there. And we should never fight again because we should handle it. You know what I'm saying? But now it don't even hit that point anymore because we have so much of this this resent that women carry from probably even the father. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. This into the child, you know, that that bonds with the mother, that's willing to just accept that personality to deal with everybody else, like how he built this relationship as a woman, not gay or anything, you know, but Still a man, still do everything, not even thinking. You know what I'm saying? Not to put that form of sexuality into it, but just the personality we're talking about. That new breed of man is definitely new breed of man. And until you break that and you build off the man that you are is when some folks don't even have time to do it because they don't even know they're talking about new breed of man. And that's the sad thing about it. When you don't know, ain't it just bliss. You're living it, you know? Harry telling me says she freed a lot of slaves, she would freed a lot more. So they even knew they were slaves. You know so it's the mindset of everything that we do. Okay. So like, um, what would this new breed of man per se, what would they uh, go like how would how would uh, they signify? Like how do they what are their characteristics in particular? Um is um, how they deal with women, you know, um, you know, how they deal with women, how they deal with other men, you know, how they just deal with issues, you know what I'm saying, yeah. um, you will never know how they deal with issues, you know, until you know the person, right, but if you're on the outside looking in, you just watch how they deal with women and stuff like that, you can see that, you know. Yeah, it's one of those emotions. Okay, okay. Definitely, especially if they put their hands on it. It's still an argument. Like, you don't do those things. Oh, like, uh, yeah, that's going to be too crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> In relationships yeah. and stuff like that, you don't want to you know, get through it. Those are emotional men. You got to be able to control your emotion. And don't even have them. You know, we know that clause your judgments. You, know, you should have some form of emotion. Like, hey, loving yourself and stuff like that and being your boy. But to involve that before anything, you deal with anything based off of your emotions. It's something you need to eliminate. And it will prevent a lot of riffraff and you'll start speaking and talking things out before you choose to deal with it based off emotion by fighting and expressing yourself. Not really knowing what you're doing. You know, it can be confusing. Um, what is the biggest piece of game that you can give to the black people? I think they live in the moment process. Like we, we were just going to discuss. I mean, you, know, you, know, you stay in that moment, right? It's, it's something hard to do, you know, but you can do it, right? And, and what I mean by staying in the moment, I mean like, when um when you feel like um, nervous and anxious and you feel that anxiety and unsure about certain things is when you live in too far in the future. When you angry, pissed off, you said for you know in your skin living in the past. But when you're at peace, like this conversation we had, you're doing exactly what you want to do. We're having this conversation, you're doing exactly what I want to do. Is when you're at peace. You stay in that moment. You don't have to worry about anything. You know what I'm saying? You're living your dream right now. You're living in this moment. If you're doing anything else, you'll be thinking about this moment. So you want to do this as frequently as possible. Stay in this moment. 
have 10, 15 interviews around the orchestra, 10, 15 more interviews. And you stand in the moment. It's going to be a little difficult because you got stuff to do, but mm-hmm. if you design yourself around it, that's what it is. Like, I had to stop sipping at one moment because I'm, I'm stayed in the moment for so long. Like, I've been in this industry heavy now. It's like four years straight every day. Spend more time inside that business than I spent at home. Okay. And every day I had a drink. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'm staying in the moment. So yeah. you can get caught up in that moment too, but it's just that time of flying, you find yourself in routine, you doing something every day, which is good, but you still got mad at it. Yeah. So, yeah. It is what it is. That's what I, I, I recommend everyone to really pay. Stay focused, stay in the moment. Just enjoy those moments right there because at the end of the day, that's exactly what we end up. Everything else is just an illusion. Like the past is done, it's gone, the past is almost, it's, it's the equivalent to tomorrow. We're right here. Right? This is what we can control. Tomorrow is always there. So there's no rush. So you still right here. Yeah. You won't worry about any of this shit. Damn, I have to pay my bill. You gotta be on pay right now, so <laughs> shit is close. I mean, you know, focus on right here. Right? So that's the key. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We won't be distracted. Yeah. We'll not be distracted at all. So, what are some things that you do to help stay in the moment? Like, do you have a daily routine? Or? Yeah. Um, but. We're not getting that. But I was just gonna say <laughs> But I was just saying like you feel me? They say like uh when it comes to like uh accumulating a certain type of wealth or just running successful businesses, you have to have like a routine to Correct. It's yeah. just like clockwork every day. Yeah. All day, every day. <laughs> I love it. I wouldn't be doing anything else. It's all hunt, you know. You get into the bag. You know. Once you get into the bag, you're not doing anything else. You know. Outside of that, you know, thing you pull. that kind of family and stuff like that, you know, that's mad you know. Yeah. Just the 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 the, the spare time you know, should be consumed in hunting. You know what I'm saying? Because a hunter never have enough food. And then you you still want to stay hungry too. That's yeah. the whole thing. It's just like how do you find like find the balance between like family time and then just like like your passion and like work? There isn't any balance. Some folks try and they drive them crazy. Family have to understand your process. Right? And that's where it lies. That's where it lies. That 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 understanding. You listen to any successful person. I don't want to say he or she, but any successful person, they'll they'll go on for hours and days of how much sacrifice they put in order for them to make the steps that the steps necessary. Because at the end of the day, somebody got to watch the kids. Somebody yeah. got to feel. And then the other person have to work on their legacy, generational. You know what I'm saying? And then you got to understand that you're on a mission. You, you, you're eliminating or relieving yourself of anything that anybody has ever taught you because so far nobody has done. So I ain't going to tell you. Mom, professors, homegirls, homegirls, even the wife. Yeah. I ain't going to tell you. You can't even tell yourself. You just gotta know it, believe in the process, don't let nobody rush your process, stay on the moment, stay consistent. Like a $10 million in your dollar is consistent. You know what I'm saying? Don't get on. Oh, I wanna pull a bell pepper. Fire. <laughs> How did bell pepper even get in the building? What were we using this shit for? Fire that person that bought. So you gotta be that. I don't wanna come on that because. Unless you're into something and everything else, you're going to miss that bill. Somebody going to change your view somewhere across the continent. 
eliminate that, you can only shop for me. This is all about it. So, just specializing in something. That's it. Focus on rocking. For me, it's alcohol. For you, it's um, media. Media. Yeah, because I'm like, uh, interviews, one of the focuses is like, uh, this is with um, uh, my collaborations with different artists, artists, but I also do uh, different podcasts uh, that are going to start dropping soon. And uh, this is almost going to be exclusive, but we're starting a, a new like cipher series slash like uh, freestyle series with artists that we'll be doing with uh, different murals in the city. So that'll be coming right. soon as well. Shit. Yes, sir. We're gonna be shooting with probably like different murals, oh, uh, yeah. street art. Yeah. So we might have to pull up one of y'all spots. I got Kobe, I got Kobe and Chia. Okay. And I got uh, like excellence in the other one. We're doing another one too. You know, I have, matter of fact, I got a couple more. Cause I got I got dogs in the gold mine. Cause I just have a dog park in there. And we sit on the gold mine. Literally, 1501 is on Main Street. Yeah. Where right? you make money in the summer. Right. right. Summit is where everything is, right? right? So underneath it is a gold mine. It's historical, those three buildings that we saw. I like to call them the Holy Trinity, one, two, three. You know what I'm saying? The beginning, the beginning is the end, so think with the end in mind, right? It's amazing, I love it, right? So we're sitting on three buildings on a gold mine, literally. We got the tracks and everything underneath it. So it's nuts in the gold district, you know what I'm saying? You know when I had the food truck in there, it was like it was like the, the golden salmon bites. You know yeah. What I'm Stuff like that. So we named certain things around the fact that there was a gold mine. It's a historical black community. You know what I'm saying? Wood, you know what I'm saying? So we had wood and seafood platter. Stuff like that. Okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was amazing. So, Not your bland chicken, because you got bland street. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Like <laughs> chicken. Okay. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. Match your okay, bland okay. chicken, you know what I'm saying? So bland street. So it was, it was fun, man. It was yeah, fun. Yeah, season well. Yeah, mm, chops okay. on Mint Street, you know what I'm saying? You know, chopping people up, you know, lamb chops on Mint Street, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So, so it was, it's, you know, so it's fun, man. It's, the joint is fun. We got creative. We dive into the business, invest in it. We're going to get exactly what you put out. That's half, you're gonna get half. A little less. A little more. So, uh, anything, what's, like, what's next with uh, 1501? Um, naming the place, you know, it ain't a name right now. We still in the process of building the place, you know, we got a lot of, um, legal stuff we're going through we're opening the other two buildings and so once the other two buildings is open it'll be 1501 the compound so what it is is three buildings right and they got all three have different names and inside i mean outside in the middle of the compound that whole outside area is considered 1501 the compound it consists of three buildings one well, is max and lola the bodega which is building one Sticks on Mint, which is the cigar lounge, and then we got 85 South, which is the club in the back. So all of those sit on a compound of 1501, which is the address, you know what I'm saying? So, okay. you know, we've been branding it and pushing it. So even to the point where we did such an amazing job as branding the outside because, you know, when we opened COVID hit, so our capacity on the inside was like, 60 or so, you know, half of that, and then you have to put staff in. So, to run a successful business and only allowing 10 people in didn't make any sense. So, that's what I kind of got creative with designing outside and making it more of an outside thing. And we jumped online and we promoted that this is a perfect place to come. We got garage doors, you can sit outside and have a beverage because nobody wanted to be inside because of COVID. And so we did that, and we did such a good job that it backfired. You know, so people look at us as an outside space. <laughs> They'll even ask, like, what are you going to do in the winter? I got three buildings. You know, matter of fact, 
each one of my buildings, right, is bigger yeah, yeah. than infused. Okay. You know, okay, and, okay. and Barrow in these places and those places is pretty successful. So if they can do it, so can we. So the okay. thing now is that, and then, you know, I even had, I had, I had a person, you know, an employee was like, you know, you got an outside spot, there's nothing we really can do about it. In the winter time, you know, people don't come here. And I was like, hold on, pay attention. I made it an outside spot. Check it out. You wanted me, wanted me to show you how I made it an outside spot. Before 1501 was here, that was a junkyard. Right? This okay. was a gas station, and that was a mechanic shop. The back building in the back was a warehouse, right? And they brand, they marketed it as a junkyard. So people with junk, well, they junk there, yeah. right? They market, right? So is this still a junkyard? People still bringing junk there? No, I market it as a summer, a outside, not a summer, but an outside space that still have inside spaces too. Yeah. And you know, people just forget it. So it's all about the marketing. So right now we're in the process of branding and marketing inside of the building, making it more suitable, suitable, suitable for people to sit inside and enjoy themselves. So you can still have the outside. Right. Because it has an indoor bar, outdoor bar. Correct. It's um, the biggest bar in Charlotte to be on. It, it wraps around. It go for, it starts on Main Street. And then it goes around all the way to Summer. You know. So it comes outside the building. It keeps going. Then it goes all the way around the corner. So it's a really, really big bar. Because I sell liquor. So when you walk inside that place, you're going to see some of the biggest bars. You're going to survive that. You've got another long bar. And then when you go inside the little club section, they got another long bar. Yeah. And then the bar is going to be outside. It is really good. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. All right. So uh, when, when can we be expecting like some of the other uh, compounds to be open like, as well? We have another one. Um, that one is going to be fun. Um, all right, the ones, the, the one that we have over in, 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 in South Bay, that should be complete at the end of November. Um, we're just waiting for the historical bar to write off on the pavement with two buildings because they're historically like brick buildings. You can't paint brick. So the other building is center block, so that was able to get through. You know, no problem. But the other ones are red brick, so when they give us the okay, I can paint all three buildings one color and kind of pull it all together and make the signage, you know, and make it a more of a standout thing because people will come over there and they don't even see the buildings. They don't even know those things exist. Like, you know, like, and it's fun. I like it that way. So when I do open it, it's like, wow, where did that come from? You know, it's fun. It's amazing. The wild factor. And, and you said like is it like the signage on it or like the neon is going to be like a similar color or is this going to give off a similar vibe um um I'm going to leave that to the professional right I'm going to have my hands involved with it or how I want the signing to be for each for all three um because I do want them to resemble but I still want them to have the same identity as if three different owners, right? Um just to be fair, you know what I'm saying? Um if you want to come for a cigar, you don't go think fifteen or one, right? So it's not giving a cigar lounge an opportunity to be great, right? Because fifteen oh one for people is a fun day a Sunday fun day spot or a summer spot, but you know, so you just want to you want to brand and market each individual as who they are, and in the summer when the when the weather breaks, you know, you open up the backyard and the side court and the whole outside that let people go from one place to the other to the other. Yeah. So just imagine you and your lady go to 15, you go to the compound of 1501, say in the summertime, right, um, yeah. or even in the winter, you know. Your lady will probably hang out in Maxwell or the bodega or they have a hoop or whatever the case may be. You'll probably go in the cigar lounge and watch the game and the fight and have a stick with some guys and yeah. sip some, you know, some nice cocktails with some 
beautiful waitresses and stuff like that. Star tenders, I like to call yeah. them. And then you'll have, you know, a section booked at 11, 12 o'clock in the club. So when you sit there and you pregame and everything, or maybe you only want to smoke on a stick, you want to go sit outside in the backyard or something under the tent and, and vibe out and sleep with some weed or something. I don't know. But, um, you know, and then, uh, cause you know, you're outside and, uh, and then, you know, it, hey, babe, and then y'all just walk up the hill and go into the other location. It's cool. You don't have to leave. You park and you navigate throughout all three buildings. It's fun. You can so, buy a bar hop through the traffic. Correct. Different correct. Vibes bing, different bing, bing, bing. And then you got this monster, which to me is 1501. It's a big, beautiful space that's just outside of the three buildings. You know what I'm saying? So, I just got to rebrand it, you know, I just keep it as 1501 right now because the compound is incomplete. So, when all three is open, then they name and brand certain different ways and then, you know, it, 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 it'll work out. And that's in, that's in South End. I got another one in the West End, you know. And that one is another three buildings, Holy Trinity again. And, um, and and um, you know, it has um, a lot of a bunch of outside space. You're gonna have a dog park, um, you know, going to have a brewery, a distillery, a cigar bar, and then that area is up and coming. So, I mean, that's gonna be fun. I can't wait for that. And that's like next year. And that process is a lot faster because, excuse me, because. Those builders aren't historical, so you don't have to go through that. So to really get that done, it's really not that, not that, you know, that time consuming. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. All right. Um, well, Clyde, do, do you have any last uh, comments? No, sir. All I'm right. good. All right. Well, it was a blessing having you in today, man. Thank yes, you. Sir. Brother, thanks for having Clyde me. Clyde Thomas. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Relentless TV. It was a blessing to have you as well. We out. Please!